Well, well, when the turbo kicks in, it, boy, you really feel it. See, this is what this website is all about. Unique driving experiences. This is a car most people have never heard of, let alone seen. And I can imagine, I imagine you do really freak out the guys at the car shows when you open the hood and they see what's going on out there. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the car we're featuring today. Extremely rare, very unusual, and a real piece of automotive history. It's a 1962 Oldsmobile Jetfire with a turbocharger. This is considered to be the first turbocharged car uh, in America. Uh, a lot of people say it was a Corvair. Corvair owners say they were first. The Oldsmobile guys say they were first. I believe Oldsmobile was available a couple weeks before the Corvair. Well, you sort of get the idea. Uh, the Corvair tended to get a lot more publicity than this. Not many people know about this. Not many people have ever seen one of these. It's got a 215 V8, well, with a turbocharger, and uh, you're supposed to put rocket fuel. Well, we'll have the whole story. Let's meet the owner, Eric Jensen. Eric, come on in, buddy. Nice to see you. Hey, thanks for preserving this piece of history. I think that's really terrific. Have you always been an Oldsmobile guy? Yeah, I've always been an Oldsmobile guy. I think I started when I was 13 years old, about 1987 or so. Now, why why Oldsmobile? Why that particular brand? Well, my great-grandfather bought a 39 Oldsmobile brand new. Okay. My grandfather bought a 62 Oldsmobile new. My dad bought a 71 442 W30 wow. brand new. Okay, so that was and really was your father's Oldsmobile. Yeah, yep, like, yep. I remember when that campaign came out. They had, Oldsmobile had a campaign because they, they were afraid that the Oldsmobile was seen as an old man's car. Mm -hmm. So they started this campaign. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. <laughs> and it kind of backfired on them. Yeah, yes, it did. Yeah, because people didn't really think it was their father's, but the ad made them think it was. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think somebody got fired. Heads rolled over. I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, because Oldsmobile was the biggest selling brand, if not the world, certainly in America through the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I believe that's right. People thought this is gonna last forever, and of course, it met its demise. How long has it been gone now, 15 years? Uh, 2004 was last year. Yeah, 2004 was yeah. The last year, okay. Now, were you looking for one of these when you set out your quest? We, we actually was looking for a 62 Cutlass. Mm -hmm. um, now, why I, a 62 Cutlass? Well, because my wife is short. Well, that's we, good enough reason to buy a 62 we, Cutlass. We bought a <laughs> uh, 72 Cutlass for her, right. and uh, she was short enough that it, she's kind of looking between the steering wheel and the dash to right. be able to right. drive it. And I said, well, you might like a 62 Cutlass. They're a little bit smaller car, might fit you better. Right, right. So in the process of looking for a 62 Cutlass, then uh, we found the Jetfire, and we, we just fell in love with them. And now, were you aware of the jet fire before you found it, or was it one of those things, a learning process when you saw it and you researched it? You know yeah, I, mean? I, I always knew they existed, but I didn't know how many they made. I, I knew very little to almost nothing about them. Truthfully, I didn't even know it was 62 that they made them right. for the first year. And when we run into to her car, which is same color, just red interior and automatic, then uh, we just fell in love with them. I, sold off all my other cars, my 442s and really face car convertible. I mean, 471, 442 convertible. I sold all of them off and this is all we do right now. For most people, especially guys a little younger than me, the muscle car era began in 64 with the GTO. Mm -hmm. That was the first yeah. muscle car. Completely really forgetting the Max Wedge Plymouths and all the stuff that was around. But there are a lot of fast cars available from 1960 up to 64 that could be classified as mm, muscle car. Yeah. And this was sort of an, inter it had all the muscle car, you know, the intermediate body with the V8 mm -hmm. and with the turbocharger. I think, as I remember, they built like 9,000 of these, but then most were recalled because yeah, people the didn't understand the turbocharger or <clears throat> if you ran out of the rocket fuel. Yes. Now explain what the rocket fuel did. Uh, the turbo rocket fluid is uh, water and methanol right. with some water, water soluble oil to right. keep the diaphragms from drying out. Uh, these engines were 10 and a quarter to one compression and then they would boost around six pounds of pressure on right. top of that. So the fuel wasn't good enough, even in 62 wasn't good enough to, right. uh, to run them without detonation. So 
in boost mode, it would pressurize a fluid tank, right. which your fluid was in, and while it was boosting, it would inject that into use the pressurized so air. So methanol would cool the charge. Yes, it would cool <coughs> the charge, okay. and, and as the water evaporates, then it's taking the heat out so it don't detonate. So I imagine you'd get, what, about 250 miles on a thing of rocket fluid? Well, the literature says anywhere from 300 miles to 3,000 miles. It depends on how hard you drive it. Well, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're not boosting it, yeah. don't use it. But if you ran out of, quote, the rocket fuel, then it just reverted back to the 215 V8. Yes, uh, there's a, uh, a boost limit control valve. Okay. And uh, that was a secondary butterfly in the throttle body. Right. When it would activate that, the boost pressure would close that off when you didn't have fluid. Right. And that way it wouldn't boost more than a pound of pressure. Just be a regular it, yeah, just 215 V8. Yes. Well, yeah. let's open the hood and show people what we're talking about here. You know, this is a body style most people have never even seen, let alone something as exotic as it. Look at that. I mean, that's pretty exotic for 1962. <laughs> that looks like the most complicated piece of business you could possibly there, imagine. There's a lot going on there. There is. There's... There really is. And I love all the turbo rocket <laughs> and all of this. Oh, and there's your turbo rocket fuel, a fluid. Yeah. It, it's not fluid. It's fluid. It's not yeah. fuel. So, uh, okay. Uh, important use turbo rocket fluid part number of, uh, uh, available at your Oldsmobile dealer. Turbo rocket fluid capacity five quart. Well, it's definitely the jet age. Yeah, well, that was the thing. Anytime you ask people to do something above and beyond, oh, it's too much trouble. You know, when uh, when the rotary wankles came out on the mm -hmm. Mazdas, all they said to people was, every second gas fill up, just check your oil. Oh, no, I'm not <laughs> doing that. Oh, no, I'm not. I mean, that's, people, you think it was the biggest chore mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, yep. people were so, so lazy. That's, yeah. that, that's kind of affected these two. People didn't want to fill their fluid tanks. Yeah, that's the reason it was not success. People would yeah. drive it three or 400 miles and the power would drop. Because th this turbocharger gave you about 40% more power, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think 35 I think Oldsmobile said 35 to 40 percent more. Wow. Than what they okay. were, I think. So the standard horsepower, the V8. The was standard V8 was 185 horsepower. Right. And then the Jetfire was the one horsepower per cubic inch. It right. was a 215 horse, 215 right. all aluminum V8. And this is a, a pretty light car, isn't it? Yeah. The, this car itself, once I got it done wet, full tank of gas was 2,900 pounds. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with, with with fluids. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. But it just looks great. And that's the way it was done. The body of the turbocharger was red. On 62s, they were red. 63s, uh, they were all silver. Okay. And, and most 62s were red. There was actually some of them had silver turbos as well in 62. Now, I imagine you could hold a Christmas party in a Motel 6. There can't be a lot of guys in this club. No, there's, there's, not, <laughs> there's not very many. Um, we, we know, counting the parts cars, we know of roughly 120 of these cars. Oh, that many um, around? There's, uh, there's less than 50 of them with func correctly functioning turbos. Right, right. Uh, the reason we know that is because if it's never been rebuilt, it's not functioning correct. Right. The diaphragms have dried out in them, and, and yeah. Jim Knoll, is a guy in Minnesota. Uh, he rebuilds these turbo systems, and uh, well, I can rebuild them now too. But I got to source my parts through him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we know how many he's rebuilt, and how many I've rebuilt, and not all of them that he rebuilt went on a jet fire. Right. There's some uh, MG guys that have put these on their MGs, and Cutlass convertible guys will put okay. them on their Cutlasses. Now it seems to me it's mostly. Gaskets and diaphragms, right? It is mostly. Can't uh, you make those? Aren't those? Well, the gaskets, we, we can make the gaskets. Uh, Jim has made them since then. I've actually had them made on a uh, CNC cutter right, right. now off the original prints. The, the real hard parts are uh, like the boost limit control valve. Yeah. The diaphragm inside there, well, th them weren't never meant to come apart and they're crimped together. They were just a disposable part. Well, you just can't go to Oldsmobile and buy one now. Right, right. So you got to actually cut it apart. And luckily, that valve is the same diaphragm as air conditioning servos. Right. So we can take those diaphragms and, and rebuild those boost limit control valves. And there are several valves like that that you got to do that to. Okay. You. 
and then we got crimping molds to crimp those all back together. Now, is this a generator or an alternator? 62 was generator, 63 was alternator. Okay. That's when yeah. they made the split. So this is the last year of that, okay. Interesting. And the ruck, now do you mix your own methanol? Ruck? Yes. Yeah. We, fluid? Yeah, we mix our own. You could use the original stuff. I mean, it don't go bad. Yeah. But, uh, but we just mix our own. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Wow. And obviously you purpose air filter in here. Yeah, actually the air filters aren't even available. I, uh, I have to get them custom made through k and n And these cars are really a community effort. I mean, everybody in the community. There's a Fusic automotive that specializes in a lot of Oldsmobile stuff, and luckily I was talked them into reproducing the upper radiator hose because all we had before was your accordion-looking hose that right. you could use. Then K and N, we've had them do the filters. The like that AC button is commonly missing. Right. Um, That's uh, a pressure relief. Yeah. Okay. If you overboost, it'll pop that off. Okay. It's but spray fluid. No, it basically will relieve pressure out of here. If, okay. if your bypass valve and the turbo gets stuck, it will overboost, and then that will pop this so that it don't overboost, uh, which triggers another yeah. safety. It's just funny how technology just gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. uh, we had some people here that were about 40 and under. They never heard of Corvair. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just. And it's got a turbo, what? <laughs> I mean, it all seemed very, yep. this seems way more complex than oh, the yeah. turbo in the uh, Corvair. That didn't have a wastegate on it or anything. Yeah, That's well, it. I think they had lower compression yeah, on yeah. those. And then with, with those, we'll be able to have the high compression with boost, then uh, it's that, that really complicated things. It's funny, because before Pontiac became the performance arm of GM, Oldsmobile was the Rocket 88, the yeah. overhead valves, mm -hmm. and the yeah. rock and roll song, Chuck Berry, my Rocket 88, yep. and all that kind yep. of stuff. And then, of course, the 442, and mm -hmm. all, all the, yeah. yeah, just, yeah. And, and it's aluminum block, isn't it? Yeah, all aluminum. The heads, the block intake, timing cover, all it's all aluminum. I mean, I can remember back in, you know, just the old guy, you know, those aluminum motors, those things melt down, and. They, they get rotten from the water and uh, you know, you know, all kinds mm -hmm. of problems. Yeah. yeah. Do you run, uh, like I use Evans uh, Cool and some, some of my stuff that has aluminum yeah. heads because I'm just worried. I know. was seriously thinking about using that whenever I put this car back together. Yeah. Uh, the reason I didn't, I don't know how that works because see the, the coolant on these runs through the turbo and right. also runs through the throttle body. Oh, okay. And I didn't know I, I guess I could have called them, but I, I didn't know if That's, that really mattered. Well, you'll find that it tends to run about 10 degrees hotter. Yeah, and see, these like to run yeah. pretty hot anyway. Right, right, yeah. Well, th this one, I haven't had any trouble with overheating, but, but some of them, some of them you can get a little bit of yeah. issue with overheating in traffic. Is it faster in cold weather? A little, but yeah. not not noticed, not too much. Now, I understand you brought some parts from, from the turbo to kind of illustrate what's going on. Yeah, I've brought a little bit of stuff. Uh, one's just mainly the impeller. And They're, that turns at like, what, 40,000 RPM? Well, on this car, they uh, they spend at 90,000. 90,000? Yeah, yep. And what kind of bearings? Is well, they're they're actually aluminum bearing. They're, uh, they're a floating bearing, so right. they spin basically half the speed of the impeller. Wow. So they, they spin on the outside and inside. Right, right. But yeah, they're, they're roughly two inch, I think, what they called them for, for the turbo size. But then, uh, and this is what they called the fluid valve, right. fluid metering valve. Okay. This is what works the... Little brass floats in there? Yeah, this is what works the fluid injection. Yeah, I see. You know, they've been using brass floats since mm -hmm. the turn of the century, because they work. Yeah, yeah. yep. Okay. Now it looks like there's a needle there, but there's no needle. At the well, that's on the bottom side. This is what would oh, I see, trigger I see. your ball. Oh, I you. Okay, there you go. Yeah. But there's a pretty complicated. So you could you could 3D print these parts. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we uh, luckily these we have plenty of these. Yeah. The parts that are tough to come by are uh, are more of the internal turbo parts like the shaft seal right um, a lot of those parts are the tough ones 
And what do you do with ethanol? How do you deal with it? Is that a problem on this car? Because it didn't exist at the time it was built. And every I, I have had a lot of problems with the power piston and the carburetor sticking. Yeah. And I never really knew why. And for the past two years with my wife's car and, and this car, since I've got it done, I've went to, uh, I've been running uh, non-ethanol gas. I, there's a station there where I live where I can get it. Oh, okay. And I've not had any more troubles with the power piston yeah. sticking since yeah. then. So uh, if you can run the ethanol, it's just, I got to pop the top off the carburetor and clean the power piston about every year. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Because it really is just the bane of every old mm -hmm. car guy's existence. Yeah. Rots out the carburetors and the pop metal yeah. and all that yeah. other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're lucky you, get, you can't get non-ethanol fuel in California. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. Yeah. Do you run any uh, a sort of Marvel mystery oil or anything like that in the no, gas? No, I uh, just, just regular gas and oil, or well, I mean regular oil. Yeah. And, and my, premium fuel. Yeah, I do do really need the highest octane. See, that's the other issue is my non-ethanol fuel is, it's uh, I think 90 octane. Okay. So, uh, so I'll put about four gallon of 110 with Right. With a, the rest of the tank filled I'm up. I'm surprised with, it doesn't say premium fuel only. Does it say it on the on gas On the cap? gas cap it oh, does. Oh, it does say it on yeah. it. Well, yeah. um, on 63 it says it on the gas cap. Yeah. On 62 it actually didn't say it on the gas Because I cap. remember 63 is about 35 cents a gallon. So <laughs> who's got that kind of money, yeah. really? Yeah. Because regular <laughs> gas is 24. Mm. Yeah, premium was in wow. the 30s. Yeah, I remember my father complained that. 35, got that. <laughs> furious about that. Yeah. Very cool. Is that the stock radiator as well? Yes, I uh, had a new core put in it, but yeah. uh, it's it's one of the very early cross flow radiators. Yeah, they, yeah. They didn't have too much of that before '62. Well, it was a very advanced car. I mean, it really is. Uh, I can't thank you enough for preserving this piece of history. It's oh, just thanks. great because I know guys who think they're car guys never heard of this, had no idea yeah. what it is. And oh, they're they're be, great at a car show. Oh yeah, yeah, because you you got the only one. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you only see, look at so many Camaros and Mustangs, you know, mm -hmm. and you never think of Oldsmobile as the performance arm of GM, but it really yeah. was. I yeah. mean, they just fast, and of course you got your single master cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about upgrading it, but the the brakes on these cars actually work well. Yeah. The it's got a good bore in it. There's no pitting, so, right, right. Yeah, so I was yeah. like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm going to run like it was." Looks good, and I love the way the voltage regulator just—it's interesting. Everything was moved to make way for the, yeah, for the yeah. turbo. Well, even the even the hood insulation had to be cut out for the, well, even this rod specifically, because the cutlass would have had two of them like this. Right. They, they had to angle it to miss the air breather. Yeah, yeah. And you pull your air from right here. Yeah. Right? Yep. God, there's not even room for a, <laughs> you know, to get cool cold air, sort of ram air package. Yeah. And they're definitely hot under the hoods uh, on these cars. I imagine it is, isn't it? Because you're yeah. spinning at 40, 90,000 90, RPM. Yeah. And then your exhaust run right up on top. And how often were you required to change the oil in this car? Do you know what it was doing? Uh, I change it every year. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the original intervals would be. I just wonder how many miles because of the turbo and all yeah. the, you know, the high heat and everything. All right, let's close the hood. And let's walk around the car again and see. You know, it's such an unusual body style. Let's talk about the interior of the car here. You open your door on your side. I'll open this one. And those are the original seats here. Boy, I would guess those were almost Brand new seats. Those are the originals, huh? Yep. Uh, everything in the interior is all original except for the dome light lens and, and the painted surfaces. And how many miles on this car when you got it? Oh, uh, when, when it was found in Chicago, it had 44,000 original miles on wow. it. Wow. Okay. Um, the, the original owner had smoked in it a lot, so it, it was pretty stained. It had a lot of yeah. fading in the carpet, so I, I had to do a lot of cleaning and spraying on the carpet to get the collar back. Now, what transmission is that? That is it's, that same as Corvette. Well, it is. I think uh, it's the T10, T right. but uh, these had the iron case with aluminum tail shaft. I think the Corvette had an aluminum case. Okay, because you know it's funny because this is a pretty advanced car, 
most cars that were manual transmission, especially in 62, were three speeds. Yeah. When yeah. the Mustang came out, the three speed was standard. You paid extra for the automatic or the four speed. Yeah, yeah. You know, so for this in 62. Well, the, the four speed was actually an option on these. They, they considered the three speed standard. Right. But uh, I think the production records show there was only like 14 of them made with, uh, with a three speed. The rest of them were automatics. And yeah. well, the four speeds, uh, there's 203 of them that were four speeds. I mean, it's funny because when you read advertisements for the period for a lot of stuff, one less gear to shift <laughs> with three speeds. You know, that was, that was a selling point. Yeah. You didn't have to, you know, you weren't, you weren't rowing the box all day long, you know. But very, and what is that, a vacuum gauge? In this yeah, thing? it's a vacuum boost gauge. Yeah, the, uh, you had the economy mode and you had the power mode. Oh, it's, yeah. So when you put your foot down, oh, it would go to power mode. I mean, yeah. It's so yeah. I mean, why? It's just so <laughs> useless. Yeah, a tachometer would be a lot more Yeah, useful. you'd think they would have had a tachometer, but it was, you know, the thinking at GM, I remember when somebody tried to introduce disc brakes and they said, what's in an airplane? You're trying to, so where are you going? I mean, it just seemed like the most ridiculous thing mm -hmm. in the world. You know? Yeah. Uh, very cool. I love the, uh, I love the Speedo up there. I love that panel, the way it sits on top. This is just a forgotten body style. You just don't see them anymore. And of course, it's a two door coupe. Did they make a four door? No, all jet fires were two door hard tops. Okay. Oh, okay. Jet fire. I just like the name. It just, you know, <laughs> yeah. The uh, the story is on these cars too. Is Buick offered a hard top on the Skylark, I believe it was. Right. And uh, well, Oldsmobile only had the post coupe in the F85 and Cutlass. So uh, the story is that they went to the Buick stamping plant to get the roofs for these cars because they already had the roofs hard top. And what did this car sell for new? Do you know? These. Uh, the base price was uh, right at three thousand dollars. I think it's three thousand sixteen dollars. Oh, that wasn't cheap. And, uh, no, they weren't. Actually, a buddy of mine in Florida's got a '63, really high option, air condition, power, everything. Yeah. And it was a little over four thousand dollars on his window sticker. So. '62. So his was '63. '63. But yeah. But that was a lot of money. Yes. That was Cadillac. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny too, I drug a 63 out of a barn in Iowa. Yeah. And it, it was the original owner car. And uh, he said whenever he bought it new, he brought it home, his dad was just absolutely upset because he couldn't believe that you spent this much money on this. You could have bought a 98 Oldsmobile for this much right, money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. So did, did these have any kind of competition history in terms of? Actually, they didn't. Um, there's stuff. actually, there's actual literature, I'd have to find it again, but there's actually a, a piece of Oldsmobile literature, I think it was a speech maybe one of the engineers give, that specifically stated that they weren't building a race car. Right. They were just building a car to perform nice in the street. And you've got some video of you restoring this car, correct? Yes, okay. yeah, I've got a, got a few videos on my on my YouTube channel. And what it looked like the day you got it and you brought it home? There's, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of that. Uh, Ryan Brett that does the barn find hidden gem cars. Yeah. Uh, he's got a real good video of this car when, as they found it originally in the, uh, it had been in 2015, the garage in Chicago. Wow. And, uh, and then my videos pick up after where he found it. And that's the original color. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've got a little more metallic than it, did originally, right. but it, but it's it's real close. Much rust in the body when you got it. There actually wasn't, and that and that's funny. Also, I was gonna walk away from this car because you hit it from underneath and rust was just flaking off of it onto the floor. It was pretty dry rust, but it was still there. And you know how rust is; right, it's always right. worse than it looks. Right. And uh, I told the guys, man, I know it's a four-speed car, and I said, I know that's crazy rare, but. I said, I, I think I'm gonna have to walk away from it. And my wife tells me, so well, let, let's go outside and, and talk a little bit. And uh, so we go out there and well, she was excited because the same color as hers, just, right. just uh, four speed, hers automatic. And she said, uh, I think it'd be cool if you restored that, we'd have a his and hers car. And, and uh, I was like, sold. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, see, <laughs> so, uh, you see, the way it usually goes is where you have one. Yeah. You don't need two. Yeah, yeah. Why I'm do you pretty, need two cars? I'm you pretty have one lucky car. on that. Yeah, yeah, see, so, so but, you're very uh, lucky. You're very yeah. lucky. 
So we get it home and, and I get it up on the lift and, and the rust wasn't nearly as bad as, yeah, as I thought it was. So I, luckily we didn't have to replace anything in the floor pans. It, oh, it that's was, great. See, there was so. a lot of pitting underneath, but everything was solid. I didn't yeah, have to replace yeah. anything. Well, hang on to that wife. Yeah. No kidding. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, that's, that's one good thing about car guys. You always know where they are. Yeah. When you yeah. come home reeking your transmission fluid, <laughs> they know you're not out fooling around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, car guys make good husbands. There you go. Power steering? No. Yeah, oh, that's that's one thing oh, I that's upgraded. power steering. I did see that. Yeah, yeah I... Uh, you regret I, I kind of regret doing it. I, oh, you put it in? It was a manual steering car, and I put power steering in it. Yeah. Um, the reason being is the manual steering, it's like really, really slow yeah. ratio. Right. And the power steering's a little faster, mm -hmm. but not that much faster. Right. And you can't get the upgrade for the steering to be even quicker. So, right. so uh, looking back, I'm like, I drive the car, but I could have lived with a slower steering ratio. Yeah. Yeah, the older you get, you'll appreciate the yeah, power steering. Yeah. Let's take a look in the trunk and see what you okay. got. Ah, there's a whole gallon of uh, turbo rocket fluid. That's it. That, I don't know. I just like. I love that era of everything was omatic, cruise omatic, you know, mm -hmm. it's, all that kind of stuff. Uh, turbo rocket fluid. Well, yeah, the space race was just starting. This is. This is before John Glenn, isn't it? Or just about the same time. Yeah, right around. I don't yeah. know what year John Glenn was. Yeah, I think that was about Definitely 60. before the moon. Yeah, 63, something like that. Is that an original spare? Yes, that's the original spare tire. Boy, that is a skinny tire. Yeah, yes it is. You'd be laying rubber all day long with those. Yeah, yeah. well, and see this car also has the 15 inch wheel option, which most of these cars had 13s. 13s, not yes. 14s, huh? yes. wow. Yeah, the 15s is a really pretty rare option. Yeah, yeah, my Corvair has got uh, 13s on it, which are really funny tires. Well, yeah. you've done a beautiful job restoring it. Thank you. I mean, this is what I like. You know, a lot of times people over-store stuff. I know you thought your chrome didn't look good. I think the chrome looks fantastic. It looks factory. Yeah. It looks correct. Sometimes make it so perfect, oh, you can't sit in it, you can't touch it, you can't drive. I mean, yeah, I like the yeah. fact that it's a, a real car and you can use it and drive. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Really yeah, I've cool. had it done for, what, four or five months now, and yeah. I think I've put six, 700 miles on it so oh, far. Oh, cool, cool. Can I take it for a drive? Sure. Oh, let's give it a shot. Boy, this thing goes good, and for 1962, it goes really good. Well, he's done a wonderful job restoring this. You know, this is just the kind of restoration I like. All the important stuff has been taken care of. All the mechanical pieces, it runs flawlessly, everything works. You know, I know he seemed a little worried about maybe the chrome didn't look as good as it should, but I think it looks fantastic. Yeah, well, well when the turbo kicks in, it, boy, you really feel it. See, this is what this website is all about. Unique driving experiences. This is a car most people have never heard of, let alone seen. Yeah. It goes really nice. Quiet, smooth. You could drive, you could have driven it out here from Indiana. It's like I was saying before, people always think the muscle car era started in 1964 with the GTO, but it really started the whole 60s. I mean, my 61 Chrysler 300G, that's 375 horsepower with two four-barrel carburetors. You had uh, fuel-injected Corvettes. You had the turbocharged Corvair. It's so funny, the, the Corvair guys and the, uh, and the Jetfire guys kind of threw rocks at each other because each one thinks it was the first. And I think I gotta go with the Jetfire. I think although the Corvair, I think may have been first in the showroom, you could order one of these before you could order the Corvair. So this probably wins. And uh, most historians tend to give it to the uh, Jetfire. It, it certainly had more, uh, a more, much more sophisticated delivery system with the rocket flu fluid and all of that stuff. You know, the Corvair Turbo, which just had no wastegate on it at all, it just kinda, uh, yeah, it was a very simple unit. Whereas this thing, it's uh, got all sorts of diaphragms and, 
and Pella's turn at 90,000 RPM. And no, it's it, it's really a, a neat piece of kit. I, I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic car, and it's so unassuming in this body style. You know, this is really a sporty car, especially by 1962 standards. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it, it's just amazing. I mean, the gear shift falls readily to hand. That's what they always used to say in the old magazines. And I imagine you could have blown off a lot of Corvettes and stuff with this back in the day. Transmission is great. Works terrific. Shifts very nicely. Full synchro mesh. I like guys like Eric, nice guy. You know, family guy, got a nice family. The whole family kind of gets involved in the restoration process. Understanding why, you know, you, you need that. <laughs> You're gonna be in this hobby. But it's just nice to see, you know. I like people that can do their own work and fix things themselves. And that's why I'll always take a, a home-built restoration over a, uh, over a, you know, a big fancy shop. I'll tell you one thing that always makes me laugh. It's not all the time, but it happens a lot. I get these big fancy restorations from shops and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars and the horn never works, you know. Oh yeah, we forgot to look at the horn. You know, a guy like that, he uses the car, he drives it. No, oh, see, the horn works fine. You know, it just makes me laugh. We've, we've had a bunch of cars like that, you know, six, seven hundred thousand dollar restoration, just crazy. Oh, 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 yeah, we forgot the horn or the wipers or they forget something because they're so visually oriented, they forget it's a mechanical device and you've got to, it's got to work properly too, not just look good, but, you know, a lot of times cars are restored for auctions or just for show, not to be used. And this is a car that's driven on a regular basis and that's, uh, that's what I think is great. We'll get some wide open road here and see what she does. Wow, look at that. It, it pulls very nicely and very smooth. This makes me want to go back and dig out my old magazines and read the road test. They always like reading the period stuff as opposed to, uh, you know, a modern uh, uh, look back type of deal, you know, because then you, you, you feel how excited the driver was at the time and how it must have felt in comparison to the other cars that were available. And this car weighs less than 3,000 pounds with all fluids. That's unbelievable. When you figure the water and the fuel and the oil, I mean, you're probably looking at uh, 60 pounds, 100 pounds, I don't know. Very smooth engine. This is a wonderful uh, aluminum V8. And you know, it is not the Buick V8. Uh, this is an Oldsmobile version. I love noble failures. I love it when a company like GM takes a chance on a vehicle like a Corvair, like this, like turbocharging. You know, we live in such a litigious society now. Anytime you try something new, you wind up getting sued up the yin yang for it, you know? Uh, so consequently, nobody wants to take a chance on anything. But this, I think, is just great. It's just great. It was probably too complicated for Clem at the Shell Station or the average backyard mechanic to fool with. So that's why I think a lot of them got pulled and people didn't like to do the maintenance, as I said. But when you set them up right and you got the right rocket fluid, oh, they're great. You feel that turbo start to kick in. There you go, look at that. Pulling hard. Very nice. I love to give guys like Eric publicity for their work because, uh, you know, he saved a piece of history, a piece of technical history, uh, you know, and, and people are not familiar with these, they haven't seen them before. It gets interest going. Who knows, maybe if some will come out of the woodwork, there might be a few out there we just don't know anything about. So if it helps to discover something, that, boy, that's pretty cool. But this, I think, qualifies as a muscle car. Certainly in 1962, a lot of advanced technology, aluminum block, turbocharging, pretty amazing. 
So if you got a uh, model that says Oldsmobile rocket fluid on it, hang on to it. That thing's going to be pretty valuable. You know, it's so funny to read about something when you're 12 years old, and then you got to wait almost 60 years to actually drive it. So I want to thank Eric very much for taking the opportunity and taking the chance and contacting me. Uh, I'm thrilled that he did. And if you got anything unusual like this, drop us a note and uh, we'll invite you on the show. But uh, yeah, this is, this is great. This is great. So Eric, thanks again. His family uh, drove out with him. They're all at the garage. So it was really fun to meet his whole family and see the pride everybody took in the car that dad built. So pretty cool. Eric, thanks again. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>